Hey, Chandler Bolt here, and joining me today is Gretchen Rubin. Uh, Gretchen is awesome. So she she was on the Self Publishing School Success Summit way back in the day, I think 2016. Um, so really great to to reconnect. She's the author of the Happiness Project, Better Than Before, The Four Tendencies. Outer Order, Inner Calm, and a bunch of books. Um, we're going to talk about some of those experiences here. She's also a host of an award-winning podcast uh, called Happier with Gretchen Rubin. Uh, she's got GretchenRubin.com where she blogs and a new app, uh, which yeah. is cool. So we might get to talk about that. Um, but really excited to have you here, Gretchen. Welcome. I'm so happy to get the chance to talk to you again. Thanks for having me. So let, let's maybe start by going back to your first book. And I think I was just going through this to just even prep for this interview. And it's a very interesting kind of topical shifts kind of throughout your career that I want to talk about in a bit. Uh, but why did you decide to write your first book? Um, well, I was I was a lawyer at the time. I was actually clerking for Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. Um, and I I. I was going for a walk one day on Capitol Hill and I asked myself a rhetorical question. I was like, what am I interested in that everybody else in the world is interested in? And I thought, well, power, money, fame, sex. And it and I was just like, power, money, fame, sex. This, this, this subject just grabbed me. And I went out and started doing a huge amount of research and note taking, which is something that happens to me all the time. Like even when I was a child and to this day, I'll get intensely interested in something and do a bunch of research. So that was familiar, but this just kept getting bigger and bigger. And I was spending so much time on it. And then and then finally, one day it occurred to me, I was like, well, this is the kind of thing a person would do if they were going to write a book. And then I thought, well, maybe I could write that book. And then I went to a bookstore, got a book called something like How to Write and Sell Your Nonfiction Book Proposal. And I just followed the directions. Um, so I didn't sort of start out thinking I'm going to write a book. I just was swept along with my interest in a subject. And it it just got so just my 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 source material got so vast that I thought yeah. eh, I should turn this into a book. And then I and that's how I made it. And, and I did get that book published. And then I have been a professional working writer ever since. Cool. And which book was that? That's called Power, Money, Fame, Sex, A cool. User's Guide. Yeah, cool. And what um, so what do you think shifted from? Oh, hold up. Am I going to write a book? Like, I guess this is what people who write books do. What do you think shifted from that to now? I mean, you've written a bunch of books and it's a part of, it seems like you're always working on a book, looking at release dates. It's like, you've got one that comes out every two years or so. Um, at one point, I think you did, it was, there was a one year gap. Um, so now it just seems like you're a really prolific writer and content creator. What do you think that shift was? You know, I think, and this sounds funny to me now, but I think for a long time when I was younger, I didn't really see a place for myself in the in the world of books. I've always loved reading. It's my favorite thing to do. I majored in English. I've always, I would always like write a paper instead of take an exam. Uh, I did everything a person would do to become a writer. You know, I was preparing myself, but I was like, okay, you're either a novelist, a fiction writer, or like a poet or a playwright, or you're a journalist. Or you're kind of an academic who, you know, writes a biography of, you know, Queen Victoria. And I didn't want to do any of those things. So I didn't really see a place for myself in the writing world. And um, it was only when I really understood, like, sort of what, what is now called creative nonfiction, um, that I understood uh, how I could carve out a place. Now creative nonfiction is, is huge. It gets tons of attention um, and it's it's very robust. But for some reason, I never saw it as a place for myself uh, until I did. And then I was like, oh my gosh, I, I have so many ideas for nonfiction books that I want to write. Um, so yeah, now now I have so many things that I, so many projects that I want to work on. But for a while, I just, I just, I didn't see a place for myself as a yeah. writer. Oh, interesting. It's almost like the lens changed. And yes. it, 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 was, it went from, this is what I know books to be, or this is what the world says books are. Huh, yeah. This is this thing where I actually feel like I could contribute. Well, also, you know, growing up uh, and, and, and for most of my young adulthood, I read almost all, not all fiction. Um, so I really didn't pay much attention to what was happening in nonfiction, except for like the odd memoir, the odd, odd like history uh, book here yeah. and there. Um, and so uh, I think part of it was also came out of my reading. Um, and so I do think that if, if for writers, you know, it's so important to read, 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 and read a lot of different stuff 
um, because sometimes you don't know where your idea is going to come from or how something's going to hit you. I mean, mm-hmm. I think this, I know this is a false memory because I, I did the timeline and like tried to figure it out. So I know this is absolutely not true, but it feels true. I feel like I went into a bookstore and saw a copy of Mark Kurlansky's COD, The Eyes of the World Through the, 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 the Story of the World Through the Eyes of a Fish. And, and thought, oh my gosh, like this opens up a whole new world for me. I can write nonfiction. I know that's not true, but I, I feel like I remember that. That's what yeah. it feels like. Yeah. Oh, interesting. It's almost like a subconscious memory or a dream or a shift that opens some of this stuff up. Yeah. So I, I love that you touched on that because I, I had a question on that, which is, so, you know, early on in your career, you wrote at least that I can find two books on people, right? One on JFK, one on Winston Churchill. Yes. And so, and it, so it sounds like just kind of piecing all this together now is okay. You grew up reading fiction, which I would assume led to an interest in writing creative nonfiction or story-based nonfiction. And then now maybe rounding out to sure more creative nonfiction, but kind of almost more, it's not people-based, it's more kind of traditional nonfiction in that uh, you're, you're not writing about JFK or Winston Churchill. What did you learn from that? And how did that writing style or focus kind of shift over the years? Well, it's funny because from the outside, those books look very, very different. But to me, they they feel actually very much connected and of a piece because really what I'm interested in is human nature. Um, you know, who are we? Why do we do what we do? How can we change if we want to change? And so for me, like a biography of Winston Churchill is actually very, very similar to my book, Better Than Before, which is all about the strategies mm. of habit change. Because what I'm interested in, in, in Winston Churchill is like sort of what does he illustrate about human nature? And the reason why it's useful to study people like Winston Churchill or JFK is that they're such gigantic figures. They have these vast records. They they went through so Mm -hmm. many experiences. It's sort of a a gigantic example that you can study more easily than a more ordinary example. So Mm -hmm. while from the outside, those books look very different, really from the inside to me, they feel like very much connected. I, I, mm-hmm. and I, uh, yeah. Uh, and I'm, I'm always very interested in form and structure. So I did a lot of really fun things with, um, it, it, cause it was called 40 ways to look at Winston Churchill, 40 ways to look at JFK. Mm-hmm. I really had fun pushing structure in a lot of different ways. Mm-hmm. Um, Actually, I've, I, I had to learn how to just write an ordinary book, as my agent said. She said, I want you to just write a regular book. <laughs> that a lot of like weird structural things. Yeah. Because um, I, I, I can sort of get carried away with my enthusiasm for that, which some yeah. readers like, but some readers find a little bit distracting. Mm. So, um, so, yeah, that's how those books fit into Can my- Can you unpack that for people who are maybe less familiar with those two concepts? Like, how do you look at being obsessed with story and or structure and writing a structure based book versus write a write a real nonfiction book, kind of as your agent said. Well, what she meant by write a regular nonfiction book is like one minute it just says like paragraphs and pages and chapters and yeah. everything sort of this from the same narrative perspective. Whereas with 40, like the 40 ways book, I would have like dramatic shifts in perspective. Like the first chapter of my Winston Churchill biography is a short, but bi- like a you know, five page biography of Winston Churchill absolutely full of praise, adulatory, all his accomplishments and all 100% accurate and true. And then the second chapter is like denouncing Churchill, all his weaknesses, all his limitation, all his flaws and failures. Again, absolutely accurate. And because I was trying to show, I was trying to play with the biographical form to show like that we as readers are very much we're led by the biographer in ways that we're not even aware of. There's so many choices being made. So I, so I was, I was really playing with that. Um, yeah. And, and, and that is interesting. And you can sort of show a lot of things very economically with that. But I think mo- for most readers, um, especially if there's just a subject that they want to lear- learn about, like I want to learn how to change my habits, or I want to learn about the science of habit formation. They don't want to be distracted by a lot of like fancy pants, you know, unconventional structures. They want whatever is going to like be the most straightforward and clear to them uh. and, um, and, and sort of help them understand most efficiently. And so, um, so, so I really try to, with structure now, I really try to be led by what will serve the reader best mm. in terms of trying to understand whatever it is that I think that they are trying to find. 
Mm. So it's almost shifting from this is a, I want to structure this the way that will be fun or easiest to write to how do I structure this, this in the way that will be most impactful for the reader? Yeah. And, you know, and this is so much easier said than done. I'm sure many of your listeners are like, oh my gosh, but nothing's more challenging than structure. So I'm writing, my next book is about the five senses, right? It's just the five kindergarten sentences, you know, sight, hearing, smell, taste, touch. And right. I've been planning this book for years, working on it for years. And I've had so much trouble with the structure. It had nine sections. It had 11 sections. I had this, I was doing that. I broke it up all these different ways. I wrote it. I rewrote it. I rebroke it. And then my daughter, my older daughter was like, why don't you just have like five big chapters, each one on the five big senses? And I was like, oh my goodness, this is the biggest epiphany of all time. And so if you look at the book, if you look at the book now, you'd say, oh, Gretchen just picked like the most obvious, easy structure. She probably didn't spend one minute thinking about structure. In fact, I was absolutely preoccupied with structure for months, years trying to figure out the structure of that book. So structure can be very, very difficult. Yeah. It, it always looks easy once you read the final book. It can be right. very hard when you're writing a book. Right. It's a painting that's in progress that you're yeah. looking at and you're saying, all right, it's not there yet. And when it right. clicks, it clicks. But all the way up into that point, it's just super muddy, right? And, yeah. and very confusing. How did, you, how did you decide and land on that? Of like, okay, I think this will be best for the reader experience. I just realized that I was getting very, I was following paths of subtlety that probably were not interesting to the average person. I mean, I'm interested in a lot of very obscure things, um, which is fun for me. Um, but I also have to say like, is this interesting to other people at this level? And is it really, can, can I bring in what's interesting to me and in service of something that is, is just sort of easier to understand? I mean, you know, I, I, can, I can talk to you for hours about like the human desire for pattern, you know, like our, our, our interest in pattern recognition, but is that something people are like overtly interested in? And I realize it's better to like weave that in, mm -hmm. in, in other arguments where I can, I can make my points and, and, and point out all this like really cool information that I think is fascinating, uh, but maybe in a way that it feels just more accessible to a person who isn't convinced that they, they care a lot about pattern yeah. recognitions in humans. <laughs> yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That's really helpful. And it's also... I think that's a great exercise and takeaway for people watching or listening is yes, be obsessed with the things that you care about, but then also kind of gut check that with do other people care about this and how can I blend the two, which I think is very self-aware on your part and also makes for a great book where you're blending that, that mix of things that I love and, and things the reader will care about. Follow well, up question. Al yeah, also yeah. with nonfiction, my agent always uh, reminds me of like what she calls the no note card left behind problem. A lot of times people who love research or, or like gathering information or interviews, like they want to include everything because they're so excited and they have it. You know, it's like, I have this interesting fact. How can I leave it out? And she's just like, nothing like sinks a book more than leaving you know, including every note card. So part of it is you have to be willing. It's that old thing about being willing to cut your darlings. You really have to just be willing to cut a lot of stuff because, well, and, and Stephen King has in his book on writing, which I'm sure many of your listeners have read because it's such a great book about writing. He, he describes how at the end, like he goes through a novel and then he goes back and he says, I cut out a lot of stuff that just is irrelevant. That when I was writing, I thought maybe would pay out or go somewhere. But in the end, it was just a red herring or a dead end. I didn't really quite understand where I was going, but it just, it's all just dead weight now. And so he goes through and takes all that out. It's that, well, even someone like Stephen King, who's so prolific and, you know, such a masterful storyteller, even he, as he's writing, he's including a lot of stuff that in the end, and I'm sure he's like, oh, that's such a great little character study or, oh, this paragraph, that, that description is so fun and amazing, but it's like, it doesn't belong in this book. You got to cut it out. Yeah, that's great. I want to backtrack just a little bit and ask one more question on this. How did reading, growing up reading fiction, help you write better nonfiction books? Well, many people who write nonfiction talk about the importance of studying fiction and the, and the tools of fiction to make your nonfiction writing, you know, vivid, interesting, uh, suspenseful, um, you know, to really, really, there's so many, there's so many tools that fiction writers use that nonfiction writers use. 
I think for me, really, I mean, one was word choice. Uh, I'm a big uh, believer in, you know, you have to pick exactly the right word. That's hard um, not to get words slightly wrong. Um, and that's something that you really only get from reading and reading and reading and, and just to fill my imagination and my, and my thoughts. But one thing that I do that I, and, and again, I've done it since probably I was like eight or nine years old that I really highly recommend is anytime I read anything, if there's a passage that I particularly admire, I copy it out. Like I, I type it into a document. I have two just absolutely giant documents where, and it's just full of, of passages that I love. And I think it does a couple of things. One, when you type something out or even better recopy it by hand, you sort of understand from the inside how it works better than just reading it and admiring it. You sort of understand like how a certain effect was accomplished. Um, also, it's easier to remember. Like I think as, as writers, like you have to call up in your mind, like, Every time there's a there's a challenge, you have to like be able to generate solutions. I could do this, I could do that, I could switch it, I could move this phrase here or there, I could change this verb, I could change it from active to passive. Like you need to have a lot of like tools at your disposal. And having all these passages of like beautifully written things and, and like you know, extraordinarily insightful uh, commentary just I think helps. And then I go back to these all the time. And then sometimes when I I'll just for fun, you know, go through them just to remind myself of them, or if I need. Uh, to come up with sort of an, like a solution. Like I was just, I needed to find something. I just need, so I was writing something and I just needed a little bit of something to make it deeper. But I was like, how do you just like randomly make something deeper? And so I just went through, I just started skipping through my document to see if anything just kicked up in response. And sure enough, um, I had a thought uh, cause it just, it just helped me. Um, so it's good. It's, it's kind of a reading diary. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's very, very valuable to have that kind of, um, uh, library of That's your cool. own. Yeah. yeah. On that note, I think I read somewhere online, you mentioned about having three novels that you wrote that, that you sat on, yeah. uh, what Terrible. sparked writing those and why not publish them? Well, what they are is they are novels of ideas, um, which novels, novels of ideas are usually not good. Um, and I think I was writing novels because I didn't really understand yet that I could just write a nonfiction book. And in fact, one of the books, which was called Things, was a novel. And I, but then I, it was because I was very preoccupied. I mean, for years, I was absolutely preoccupied with the idea of why owners would destroy their own possessions. And I wrote it as a novel, but then later I published it as a nonfiction essay uh, that I did in collaboration with, a, with an artist. And that book was called Profane Waste. And really I wanted to write a nonfiction book about it, but at that time I didn't really understand like, oh, you could just write a nonfiction book about this. Um, so I tried to make it into a novel and that did not work. So those novels are not good. Um, but now, uh, now I get out all my, all my preoccupations through nonfiction. <laughs> nice. Now we, we touched on this a little bit earlier. I mean, you just have, have become such a prolific content creator. You mentioned just before this interview that it might be helpful to speak on the four tendencies yeah. framework specific to that. So any thoughts on how you use that framework within content creation and how others yes. use that within content creation? Yes, because when I was writing my book, Better Than Before, that's all about how to make or break habits. One thing that came up all the time was people doing consistent work, whether that's students who need to finish their PhD, people who are writing a novel uh, in their free time, um, someone who's written a novel but needs to do all the consistent work. Of, I mean, self-publishing, like that is a lot of work. Like you've got to be the master of like many, many different uh, um, um, tools and be very consistent. Like it's not something you can do one day and then be done. It's like, you got to do consistent work. So I became very interested in, in how to do consistent work. So I'll describe the four tendencies like in a nutshell, um, just so if people are like, oh, wow, this sounds like me, like I need to know more. People, if people want to like take a quiz and get a little report, they can go to GretchenRubin.com slash four tendencies, F-O-U-R tendencies. And it's a free quick quiz. More than three and a half million people have taken it. And, but most people can tell what they are just from this description. So my four tendencies framework divides people into four categories, upholders, questioners, obligers, and rebels. And what it looks at is how you respond to expectations. So we all have outer expectations like a, 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 a deadline at work, and we have inner expectations. I want to write a novel in my free time. So depending on how, whether you meet or resist outer and inner expectations, that's what makes you an upholder, questioner, obliger, rebel. 
So upholders are people who readily meet inner and outer expectations. They meet the work deadline. They keep a New Year's resolution without much fuss. They want to know what other people expect of them, but their expectations for themselves are just as important. So their motto is discipline is my freedom. Questioners question all expectations. They'll do something if they think it makes sense. So they resist anything arbitrary or ineffective or unjustified. They often want to customize things to make them like exactly efficient to them. Um, they can, so if, if something meets their inner standard, they'll do it no problem. If it fails their inner standard, they'll push back. So their motto is, if you convince me why, then I'll comply. Questioners sometimes have analysis paralysis. I could imagine this being an issue for your audience where I'm like, I need to find the absolutely best platform to use. And because I, I can't decide because there's so much information and I keep learning new things, I'm not doing anything. I'm paralyzed by my desire for perfect information. Then there are obligers. This is the biggest tendency for both men and women. Many people are obligers. Obligers readily meet outer expectations, but they struggle to meet inner expectations. And the solution for them, if they're trying to meet an inner expectation, is they have to have outer accountability. So if you're a person who says, I don't understand why I always keep my promises at work, but I can't keep my promises to myself, or I've never missed a deadline at the office, I don't understand why I can't keep a deadline when I'm trying to write this novel that's so important to me, you are probably an obliger. So you need to create outer accountability in order to meet an expectation. So the motto of obliger is you can count on me and I'm counting on you to count on me. And then finally rebels. Rebels resist all expectations outer and inner alike. They wanna do what they wanna do in their own way, in their own time. They can do anything they want to do. They often love to meet a challenge, but if you ask or tell them to do something, they're very likely to resist. And typically they don't like to tell themselves what to do um, they don't sign up for a 10 a.m. writing class on Sunday because they think, well, I don't know what I'm going to want to do on Sunday. And just the idea I'm supposed to show up is going to annoy me. So their motto is, you can't make me and neither can I. And so depending on your tendency, the kind of thing that you would do to help yourself work consistently would be very different. Mm, that's a really helpful and interesting framework. Uh, and uh, I, I'm imagining people listening or watching or, or finding themselves in that and that yeah. can customize how they get their book done. And how they publish. I want to talk, I want to unpack the quiz thing specifically. Um, obviously, you've got the quiz where people can take it. How has, we've talked about this a couple of times, and this is something I talk about in, um, in my newest book is like, okay, how do you use using a quiz to sell books and also deepen the reader experience? Yes. And obviously, you've got the five love languages. Um, you've got strength finders. You've got, you know, it's, it's, I don't think it's used often, but it has been used unbelievably well and successfully. And I think you're one of those. So you just mentioned, I think 3.5 or so million people have taken the quiz. How, how has that helped with book sales? I think number one, and then any big lessons learned on kind of creating a quiz alongside a book and whether you'd recommend it or not? Well, a hundred percent. Yes. People love a quiz. I will warn you, it is much harder to create a quiz than you might think. You think, oh, what kind of Oreo am I? It's like, oh, these things are fun. <laughs> it's actually a lot of work, but I absolutely recommend it. It is a great way. Also, the thing about quizzes is people will often pick them up. You know what I mean? So they tend to be more passed around more readily because people really like a quiz. There is an amazing quiz. If you want to see, I think this is the best quiz I've ever seen in my whole life, just in terms of like the quiz experience. If you go to Adobe's creative type, quiz it divides people into eight types and just how beautiful the experience of taking the quiz is it's just next level but even if you're doing something very simple like mine is very visually straightforward it's just it's just a quiz even though it took so much work to come up with the the idea of the quiz the intellectual content of the quiz was incredibly challenging the quiz itself is very straightforward um i highly recommend this and because then if people they they get their results and then they're curious. They want to learn more. And if you can kind of try to uh, show them how, oh, you know, like with, with the four tendencies, like with Obliger, a lot of people are like, this explains everything in my whole life. Like I never before understood the pattern of why I did certain things kind of effortlessly and other things, I just can't do it how, however, how much ever motivated I am. I don't understand myself. They get this insight and they're like, okay, now I get it. I have to have more. Because now that I know that, okay, so what? Tell me, like, how does this affect everything? Or, or, oh, I recognize my coworker is a rebel. And so every time I ask him or tell him to do something, he resists me. Like, I don't know what to do about that. Or 
Um, like here's an example, a, um, you, people might say, oh, you're doing something that doesn't make any sense. And you're like, but it makes sense for me, but I don't understand why. For instance, I have a friend who's a rebel who wrote a book, a nonfiction book, and he wrote the whole thing uh, from beginning to end before he tried to sell it, which is unusual because a lot of people, when they try to get published through a trade publisher, they will try to sell the proposal. So they'll write a chapter or two and an outline table of contents, that kind of thing, but they don't write the whole book. He's a rebel. He wrote the whole book. And I said, why did you do that? And he said, if I had an agent or an editor telling me, oh, you need to give it to me by this time, or I'm expecting to see this by this date, or I need to review these X chapters, I'm not going to want to do it. I want to write this book because I want to write it. I have all these thoughts. I want to get them out in the world. I'm a creative person. I wanted everybody to see like my, my brilliant insights. So I, and I had fun writing the book, but if somebody else was expecting me to do it, I wouldn't do it. So it's like, see, but to me, I'm like, why would you do such a thing? It doesn't make sense. Perfect sense for him, self-knowledge. He knew what to do. Um, so I think when people get a glimpse of that through a quiz, then they want to go to the book and get more because they realize that there's value for them there. And do you see the quiz and the book? And then at the end of the quiz, hey, get the book to, to understand this. And, and then I guess that's first question. Second question would be, do you have a predominant one that you promote the most? Like, do you promote the book more or the quiz more? What are your thoughts on that? Well, that's interesting because I have sort of, I have kind of been in an odd situation as a writer because I have a podcast, you know, which is all about the things that I write about human nature, happiness, good habits. Yeah. Um, I have a weekly newsletter, you know, there's social media. I just got on YouTube with my podcast and then I have my books and, and I have a blog where, I mean, for I had like eight or nine years, I wrote on that blog every six days a week. And now I don't write as often, but I write pretty often. So I have a lot of ways yeah. just within my own power, not even trying to get other people to pick it up or like to get pr promoted or, or, or to write, you know, freelance or whatever, just within my own creativity um, yeah. to promote things. So for me, it's much more about like, well, what do I feel like talking about? And therefore what, what is part of that? Like, let's say it's spring. So everybody's talking about spring cleaning. Well, I wrote a little book, called, super fun little book called Outer Order, Inner Calm, all about kind of like quick, easy hacks for like how to declutter your life. It's a yeah. fun little book. Yeah. So at certain times I'm talking about it a lot because it fits into what whatever else I'm talking about and kind of what's on people's minds. And then I, I move away from it because it's like, okay, why am I, why would I be, I don't really have a reason to be talking about it. I should yeah. probably do a better job of being systematic about making sure that I'm like, hitting every, like the happiness project, you know, it just had its 10th anniversary. It came out a long, you know, 10 years ago. Am I reminding people about it enough? You know, it was a number one New York times bestseller. Am I making sure that I'm reaching new audiences with it? Maybe not. Now you're making me think maybe I should make like a schedule and, and, and make sure that I, I don't, I don't mm -hmm. over index on some books and, and, and neglect others. Um, because I do tend to do it pretty, mm -hmm organically yeah i think that's human nature and probably author nature i wanted author. to show you this because i thought you might get a kick out of it i don't know if, if you can even read this yeah this is what i think is the cool thing oh about people quizzes, take right? oh yeah take the quiz they, tell, they, they yeah. read the book then they take the quiz then they tell right. a friend like hey you should check out this quiz then that friend takes the quiz then they buy the book then they say hey you should check out this book and it's kind of this infinity loop of quizzes and books which i think yeah. is unique and 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 fun Hey, I've got, we, we kind of running up against time here. I want to ask a couple of final questions. You just mentioned 10 year anniversary of uh, Happiness Project, the 10 year anniversary book. I was curious about that. Why did you decide to launch the 10 year anniversary edition and any lessons learned from that process and of kind of relaunching a book? I just wanted an excuse to sort of, you know, uh, it was a great place to sort of refresh the afterward and to, you know, just re-promote it to people who maybe hadn't, hadn't heard it. So there, you know, it was just that that was sort of a logical time where people would say, oh, okay. It makes sense mm -hmm. that this book is coming out again. Yeah. Cool. And then, and then any lessons learned from relaunching? Cause I think this is another thing I'm pretty passionate about that. I think people just don't think about is, Hey, I can relaunch my book. Like you don't, just get one launch. You can do updated revise. You can do anniversary edition. You can do additional formats. Like there's a lot of ways that you can do that. So anything that, that you learned in that process that might be helpful for people? 
Well, I think you're exactly right. And and every year when we talk about this on on my podcast, Happier, every uh, we pick a one word theme. And one year my theme was repurpose. Um, because I think one mm -hmm. of the things that we should do as writers is like, yeah, are we making, like we go to so much trouble to create this stuff. Are we doing as much as we can to make the most of it or to like get it to as many audiences who might be looking for it in different ways? So I think you're exactly right. Um, I do think, you know, sometimes you need to think about, okay, well, what would be the thing that would make it make sense? Because I do think that readers, if they feel like it's it's sort of, especially if it's basically the same book, but like has a different title, like, I don't know, I buy, you know, when you look at reviews a lot, people really don't like it when it's like, I already had this book. It just, it just, it's been sort of like, yeah. like, you know, but, and that's kind of, that's kind of fraudulent. I don't think that's what you're talking about. You're talking about like, how can I put a spin on it? So a whole new audience is fine. So. I, yeah. I think that's I think that's terrific. Um, people love things that are updated. Um, you know, people if uh, I've seen people do it where they get you know some very significant figure to write a foreword that, that maybe kind of puts a different light on something or or puts it in a in a context or shows its worth. Like mm. oh, this thing that you know if you had a book and it was like oh, this has been transformative for the for the um, for the uh, you know, for uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? You know, like if someone is uh, battling addiction, what is it called? Yeah. The the that community. Like if somebody was like, yeah, oh, this book is recovery. Uh, yeah, recovery. That's what I knew. I, yeah. I knew it started with an R. With the recovery community, then you'd be like, oh, that'd be really amazing because a lot of people who might have been like, eh, like why this book instead of another book? When they have that kind of authority figure, that might catch their attention. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. So I think it is a really great idea if, if there's a if there's a hook that makes it clear to the reader why um why the book is coming out again yeah makes sense um Gretchen this has been awesome what would be uh kind of your your parting piece of advice knowing what you know now so if you were to go back and speak to the Gretchen from how many ever years ago pre-book mm. one and mm. all the other Gretchens out there who are thinking about writing their first book knowing what you know now what would be your advice to that person I'd say the most important thing is do like know yourself. Think about what works for you. Don't let people tell you this is the right way. This is the best way. You have to get up early and right before work. You have to. I, I, I've I've talked to so many people, and there's so many ways for people to achieve their aims, and it's so much easier when we do it in the way that's right for us. And so, really think about yourself. Like, what works for you? What can you do consistently? When have you succeeded in the past? Like, if there was one time in your life where this was really really worked and it's not working now, like what was different then? Maybe it's not mm -hmm. what you think. Maybe you need to sort of learn lessons from your own past. Um, I think sometimes people think if they just whip themselves into a frenzy of desire, if they just think about, oh, I so much want to be a published author, that that will change their behavior. That isn't that desire, motivation, that is not what changes our behavior. So you want to think about like, well, what can I do you, you want to think about actions, not outcomes, because we can't mm -hmm. control outcomes, but wow. we really all have to do it in the way that's right for us. So I, mm -hmm. it took me a long time to understand that for myself and for also for other people. Um, but now I, I, every year that goes by, I, I believe it more and more to be true. Yeah, man. So good. And Gretchen, this has been so helpful and I love the four tendencies framework. Um, guys, take the quiz. Uh, if you're curious to learn more on that, uh, Gretchen, where can people go to find out more about you, your books? I know we got a new book coming in 2023. That's probably yeah. probably not even the, in the promotion. No, cycle, no, right? I'm yeah. not. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. you're <laughs> safe on that front. Yeah, if you go to GretchenRubin.com, that's like a, the, a hub for all. You can learn more about my books, um, get all kinds of free resources, uh, all sorts of blog posts about happiness and good habits. My podcast, I have a weekly podcast that I do with my sister called Happier, where we talk about practical, concrete ways to be happier, healthier, more productive, more creative. That's happier with Gretchen Rubin. I have an app called the happier app. Like if you want habit formation tools to help you as you make your journey towards getting published, there's a lot of tools there and that will help you use the four tendencies to find the right tools and stick to them. And then I'm on social media everywhere. Gretchen Rubin, R-U-B-I-N. I love to hear from people uh, with insights and questions and observations, reading recommendations, um, anything. Uh, so hit me up on social media. Cool. I love your social as well. And you talk about fun and interesting ideas there. Well, Gretchen, thank you so much. You're amazing. Thank you. I so enjoyed the conversation.